Zarathustra's message to the people of the world is that this world is a fight between good and evil and man has to use his faculties, physical, semi-spiritual uh, and spiritual faculties to decide what is good and what is not and after deciding he has to make a choice whether he wants to follow the path of good or whether he wants to follow the path of not good or evil. Our religion is our own empire. They think of us as some strange kind of human beings who are just basically fire worshippers. Parsis are great snobs. They think that blue blood is running in their bloody veins. They feel that uh, they are superior to many cultures in India and that they've come from Iran and that sort of bunk. My parents had eloped, but uh, if I had to run away with a non-Parsi, I would have, you know, been kind of murdered. We don't want any Tom, Dick and Harry in our relationship. I'm sure Uzzarasa himself will come down and say, who is you been spreading this bullshit with my name? The blooming Parsis know uh, what is good for them. So they buttered the backs of the British when they were here. in 1934 spam for 30 hours and 30 minutes wearing handcuffs. The Parsis are an endangered species. Most of them now live here in crowded Bombay. There are very few passes left. So marrying outside one's community was supposed to be wrong. It's, it, it weakens the community. outnumbered by Muslims, Christians, Hindus. They live in a city of many gods. The sun is probably the oldest god of all. Parsis and Hindus share an ancient symbol for it. Parsis cling to their own separate religious identity. In teeming 20th century Bombay, the Parsis still observe a simple reverence for God's good creations, cattle and plants, the earth, the sky, the water, the sun were the elements that controlled the lives of their ancestors millions ago in the steppes of Siberia. Long dark frozen winters, long light bountiful summers, precious cattle, vital fire. Over the centuries these herdsmen, the Aryans, drifted south 
Some took their many gods over the passes into India. They became the Hindus. Some of these Aryan people carried their fire to the land that now bears their name, Iran. To these ancient people, thousands of years before Christ was born a man called Zoroaster, a man of the priestly class, the Magi. He turned aside the confusion of many gods. To Zoroaster was revealed that there is but one God, Ahura Mazda, Lord of all wisdom, goodness, truth, seen by man as fire and light. That we are part of his good creation, weapons in the battle against evil, the outer darkness, the shadows, the lie, angry manu. The world is full of evil influences like scientifically also, not just uh, spiritually evil, but even physically evil like diseases and etc. So we've got to take care of ourselves because in our body, according to pelvis scriptures, is considered as a weapon through which the, with which the soul fights against the evil forces. So all the laws of purity helps one to look after one's body. And um, the Kushti ritual is also in a way a purificatory ritual. The Kusti, the sacred thread, girds the loins of the warriors in their striving for truth. Three reef knots daily remind them good thoughts, good words, good deeds. I've come down to Bombay to have uh, Laila's confirmation or Naujo um, to make her a Zoroastrian. And um, it's important to us that she is a Zoroastrian. We we'll bring her up as a Zoroastrian and then she decides for herself when she's older what she wants to do. It's down here that we can do it traditionally with all the rituals and all the customs that go along with this very old ceremony. Paname Kuda Paname Kuda Ye Gamcha Ye Gamcha Ashem Cha We are made to uh, go through a Naujat ceremony and we are given certain explanations and we are not allowed to question why, what, whatever. You know, and some kind of jazzy explanation is given to us which we don't really follow. Whether it's the priest or whether it's your parents or whether it's your relatives, you know. I mean, they're giving you the same thing that was handed out to them. <laughs> you know, so that's it. You don't understand a word. First of all, you are uh, praying in a language absolutely alien. It could be Latin of Persia. You know what I mean? The priests are the guardians of the ancient wisdom, preserved in ancient Persian tongues. The astrologers, the alchemists, the wise men. These are the direct descendants of the Magi, the magicians. The Sadra, the sacred vest, is the shield of the truth soldier against the onslaught of Angri Manyu, the evil one. The Sadra and the Kusti, the warrior should never be without them. The Parsis still have common roots with their Hindu neighbors. The fire is still sacred. Hindus have no Zoroaster to order their beliefs, but the priestly class is still invested with sacred thread. The ancient wisdom passes down. 
700 years before Christ was born, a king called Cyrus united the tribes of Iran. As his mighty Persian empire expanded westwards, he freed the Jewish slaves from wicked Babylon. The charitable Cyrus rebuilt the temple at Jerusalem. The Jews saw Cyrus as sent from God, and for the next 300 years, they lived as loyal and grateful subjects of the Persian Empire. At the time Christ was born, Zoroastrianism was still a major religion. Only in the 7th century after Christ were Zoroastrian friars first threatened. The devastating and unstoppable rise of Islam in Arabia. Popular, priestless and simple. This new religion undermined the old. Eventually, driven to the edge of their homeland, a small group sought astrological advice and took to boats. There are still a few Zoroastrians in southern Iran, but the Parsis, as they came to be known, brought their fire to the coast of Gujarat in India. As legend has it, the kindly Hindu king invited them to stay and build their fire temples. But there were conditions. Speak like us. Dress like us. Keep your religion to yourselves. And marry after sunset. A thousand years on, this Parsi groom is driving into the sunset on his way to marry his Parsi bride. As in the Navjot, ritual purity is required. Cattle had provided a natural antiseptic in the days of the Siberian steppes. They still use it. Has the organist come? Somebody has to tell him to start setting things up. Yeah, I can see them. You must be wondering what to do. You know how to do it. Because as soon as we go up to the stage, I don't have the key to that. Ah, Cyrus. The arrival of the British East India Company saw a marriage between British imperial ambition and the enterprising Parsis. The first Indian MP of Britain was a Parsi. Dada by Nauroji was elected on a liberal ticket from central Finsbury. <laughs> partnership was to last for 300 years, for better or for worse. Mostly for better. The Parsis repaired the British warships. Then they started to build ships. And very soon, they themselves were trading throughout the empire. The oldest ship afloat was built by the Parsis. The practical Parsis had no moral qualms about alcohol. So they sold the booze. Under their British patrons, they would turn their hands to anything. The names they gave themselves speak proudly of their trades. We like to believe that the Britishers liked uh, their honesty. That's why they were employed in the British companies earlier as cashiers and you know, that kind of thing. Maybe they were honest, fine. But I'm sure the Britishers also must have played up with them a little. They played up with the whole thing that, come on, this is a small community, we can maneuver. <laughs> you know? 
especially since they are in favor of us, we can maneuver them, <laughs> and, you know, and sort of use them, you know, to overcome problems with the other community. I'm trying very hard to kind of use respectable language. <laughs> The first ice machine in Aden, that was imported by a Parsi. The printing press was founded by a Parsi. The first Indian to be knighted by the British was a Parsi. The first Indian baronet was a Parsi. The longest ever piano concerto was written by a Parsi. Freddie Mercury of Queens, he's a Parsi. The first cotton mill in India was founded by a Parsi. The first revolving restaurant in India was built by a Parsi. The first five-star hotel was built by a Parsi. Parsis were pioneers of railway construction. The Bombay Parsis began to take on the elegant lifestyle of the Raj. They rubbed shoulders with their British patrons. Power, prosperity, privilege, public office. Parsis turned a mosquito-ridden swamp into the glittering city of Bombay. There was a reward for the diligent and truthful Parsis. Some of them became very, 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 very wealthy. We Zoroastrians believe you must have wealth. But you see, it is the means, by what means you are collecting wealth. Not black marketeering or just squeezing the blood of poor and amassing great wealth. You see, that's very wrong. These are the Parsis in whose houses there is always food, delicious to the taste, to be eaten, and the key of Zoroastrian religion is development, growth, which in no way hinders the development, like does not interfere with the life, but on the contrary enhances the quality of one's life. It's always a positive religion, an optimistic religion, a religion which sees the brighter side of life. The key to my life. Not only good thoughts, good words, good deeds, but happiness unto him who brings happiness unto others. It's good food, good fun, good friends. What else can it be? These are the Parsis, whose custom it is to dig wells and reservoirs here on the surface of the earth for the use of all. 
When the technology allowed it, the Parsis used their wealth to pump clean water all over Bombay. They created green and pleasant places for all to enjoy. Housing is a very big problem in the country, especially in cities like Bombay. I personally feel that it's a good thing that there are uh, charitable institutions, then there are places like uh, charitable housing, you know, I mean they are hardly what you call the charitable block step. They are not the slummy type of, uh, you know, housing provided. And I'm very proud that the Parsis are taking care of their own community. It's unfortunate that these ho houses are not uh, given to them in different localities as such and they are all grouped together because then that helps them to maintain their cliquish mentality, you know. That's the unfortunate thing. The office of the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, the largest landlord in Bombay. Nerve center of dozens of housing estates, hostels and sanatoriums, schools, libraries, hospitals, charitable funds donated over the centuries. They say that there are no poor Parsis. Yes, please. This is the net that catches them if they fall. Praise be to Ahura Mazda, the wise lord. Gaslighting, first introduced to Bombay by Parsi. ceremony at the age of I think 12, 13. Uh, there's a certain class which is called the priestly class which is the Athronan class and if you belong to that class you can become a priest. Also either your father or your grandfather has to have been a priest. Kawa either means cow or it is even translated as earth. Each practicing priest comes out of a madrasa that is the school which teaches the young boys to become priests. There the education is supposed to be very good, but uh, it comes up to a particular level and thereafter they are on their own. So even after graduating from the madrasa, many of them leave the profession. And that is the sad part about our priests. They are a withering lot. I'm not practicing it full time because I have a lot of other interests, my music and I hope to make a profession, have another profession which is I'm studying for business management. I am officiating at ceremonies for friends and relatives when I have the time to do it and that's the way I like it. My daddy advised me not to go into the priestly profession, he's also a priest and he did not want me to go into priesthood. Many fathers of the last generation generally advise their sons that if there's an alternative open, go to the alternative. Firstly, the income is not stable. Some days there might be work, some days there might not be work. 
you know, they don't have a fixed income. There is no retirement age. There are no retirement benefits. There are no other benefits, no other perks. Because it's a poorly paid job, settling in life becomes difficult. Marriage and all sometimes. Why? It is because nobody does anything for the future of the priest. The priest is just like thrown away people. For the Parsi Zoroastrian, there is no Friday mosque, no Saturday synagogue, no Sunday church. Scant contact with the priests at all. When the Parsi does enter the fire temple, he must purify himself with Christi ritual. He offers his sandalwood for the fire. behind a few rupees to keep alive the ancient prayers and the priests that have remembered them. Only on special occasions like the Navjot and the wedding do priests and laity share religious rites. <laughs> The superior purity of the priests is maintained by rigorous ritual. But at weddings, even when food may be cooked by impure non parsi hands, the priest may break a rule to fill his belly. There are certain purity rules for one's own self and for one's own benefit. Then there are other rules of purity regarding menstruation. Um, a menstruating woman is considered to um, give out certain uh, toxins. Menstruating women, I generally used to stay separately for a certain period of days. My God, that irritates me. That really irritates me. I get irritated even with my mother. And if she knows that I've got my periods, she doesn't want to meet me. She says, don't, uh, you know, I want to pray and these are good days just now. So don't come now. Finish it all off and come. You know, I mean, come clean, kind of. And otherwise, she's a very modern kind of a woman. First Indian lady to ride a bicycle was a Parsi. First lady motorist was a Parsi. The first lady to play tennis in a sari in Europe, she was a Parsi. The story of the Magi from mighty Iran, following the star to the manger in Bethlehem, lent prestige to the infant Christianity. Two thousand years later in Bombay, the descendants of the Magi were visited by missions from the West. The Reverend John Wilson, Scottish missionary and educationalist, arrived in 1829. He saw many similarities with the Parsis and told them that they were Christians in all but name. He urged them to abandon their ancient rituals for his own. They didn't. Wilson did not recognize that at the heart of his own religion lay ideas from a tradition 2,000 years older than Christ himself, Zoroastrianism. The notions of heaven and hell, angels and archangels, the judgment at the end of this life, the world's saviour, the virgin birth, the last judgment, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, these had been learnt by Christ's Jewish ancestors during 300 years as loyal and grateful subjects of the Persian Empire. <laughs> But the 
Christian is guilty, tainted with original sin. The Christian God created both good and evil. The Zoroastrian is part of God's good creation. Evil is something else. You know, many religions say, Oh, we'll put the fear of God into you. And there is no such thing in our faith. So there is no fear. There's only one thing, the love of God. The power of the love of our gods is invoked in many causes. If your mother has a bad leg, you might come to St. Mary's Mount. You might offer a waxen image and pray for divine intervention. Even Parsis do. Or come to St. Michael's Mahim and do the Nine Wednesdays. Many Parsis do. Or walk across the road from Asraji's fire temple and into the Hindu shrine of Sai Baba. In this shrine at Sai Baba's side stands Zoroaster because many Parsis do. But these people, they want quick answer. And so very often they are cheated by cheats and tricks and charlatans. Or even to the Muslim shrine of Haji Ali to plead with God for God knows what. Many Parsis do. They say that they believe in their religion, but then they are again going to the other people. So they are just, what's wrong in going to them? Uh, it's like having one's own mother and then again going to other people's mother, calling them mothers. It's nice to respect other people. It's nice to respect the mothers of others. We don't insult them. We respect all the religions. And at the same time, we have to stick to the religion in which we are born. Just for the sake of asking for boons. You are going, then you don't understand your religion. Then you don't understand what religion is. It's just a matter of asking boons for some people. Despite their quest for boons at other people's shrines, the simple rule remains. You may only be a Parsi if your father was a Parsi. I married Mahmoud, who is a Muslim, out of love. And I think the best religion in the world is love and humanity. My elder son Imran, I took him once to a fire temple and everything was fine and dandy till Imran decided to go closer to the where the fire is kept. I couldn't stop myself. I had to interrupt myself from my prayers and I broke off in Urdu. And I said, Imran, bete vaha mat jana. And that was enough. The priest understood, the Dastur understood that this child was not a Parsi. And uh, he just came out and he started, he started saying nasty things amounting to as much as to say that why did you bring this child into this holy or pure place so which which tantamount of as to my child is not pure have i lost my head and ever since that day i have not stepped into a fire temple myself we are living among the seas of hindus and muslims still we can preserve our identity as Parsis or Asians because we do not intermarry. Because such a small community, if they intermarry, the whole community will be wiped out within two or three generations. And we think that we have inherited rich inheritance. And it is worth preserving. Those who do not want to preserve, they can leave the community. I want to open the doors of my community. Therefore, I'm a bad Parsi because uh, Parsis want the doors closed. I'm a bad Parsi, not a bad Zarathustrian. When I'm jogging, you saw me without the Sadra and the Kasti, which is supposed to be not taken off. So I don't believe in the rituals. I believe in a ritual when it makes sense. 
when Zarathustra himself came on the scene, he had to convert people to his beliefs. So if he, as the prophet, could convert people to his beliefs, what wrong is there if anyone from any community wishes to embrace our faith? So we are done for if we do not open our doors. We got the good jobs in banks and institutions and we still maintain those jobs and now those jobs are open to the Indians. It's their clannish mentality that is causing the community to dwindle. are too relaxed and you want to lead a good life all the time and not work hard. The time has come again now where one has to put in about 10 to 12 hours of work every day. One has to come and face the competition and come out on the top. Death, the Parsi's journey is not over. After three days, the soul rises from the dead and steps onto Chinvat Pool, Judgment Bridge. For the righteous soul, the bridge is broad. For those found wanting, it narrows to a razor's edge. Now, Zoroastrian religion doesn't allow us to pollute the elements of nature. And that is the reason why we have adopted Bokhmenashini. We consign the dead body in the Tower of Silence to be devoured rapidly by the vultures and to be exposed to the cleansing rays of the sun. In that way, we can contain pollution because according to our religion when the corpse is gnawed by vultures the soul is very much pleased and you see all hardships and discomforts disappear from the soul. Zoroastrians are gnawed by vultures. Christians, Jews and Muslims feed the worms. They say that Zoroastrianism is an ecological religion. The smoker is a sinner who pollutes the fire. The priest protects the fire from contaminating breath. Irony is that it was the Parsis who introduced many of the industries that pollute the city of Bombay today. The first rubber tires were introduced to Bombay by a Parsi. <laughs> India's first underground nuclear bomb was exploded by a Parsi. For nearly 300 years, the Parsis have drifted from the villages of Gujarat to the big city. From the temples that they leave behind, the fires have gone. But one woman has returned to the countryside on her personal search for renewal. So Zoroastrian College is one of these spiritual centers which has been constructed here for spreading the pure and the true light of the ancient wisdom and keep the flame burning perpetually. In our ancient Zoroastrian religion, 
we have the knowledge of the divine universal natural law known as Totyasna, which is the effect produced by the sound of mantra known as mantravani which produces colors, shapes and forms. When we recite the Avastha Mantra, the rhythmic sound gives joy to the soul of the trees. Music too has this effect, for instance Mozart or Viennese Waltz which has a 1-2-3 rhythm gives that joy and that lilt which is in harmony with the cosmic forces of nature and the trees love it what fruits with sweet coconut tender milk in it and we are pride and joy today the parsi community in india may be termed as an age old community old age community and as a result of this the rate of population growth is negative the elders of the committee community are deeply concerned with this problem of dwindling population. From a figure of 115,000 Parsis in 1951, this Congress is, do not serve any purpose. People from all walks of life, they meet together, they talk in high-sounding languages, they give promises, which were never fulfilled. And so they just come have tea and cakes and pastries and all such things, talk about so-called problems, and then disperse. And after five years, they will come just raw like that and repeat the same thing. We have become an old age community. Over 40% of our population, the percentage of population, is over 65 years old. And a very small proportion is under 14 years old. The second thing that worries, worries us is this, that the new generation which is coming up, not only in India, but also in the different pockets of Zoroastrians in the world, where the Parsi during the last 20 years have emigrated, we feel that they are going to be merged into that society, apart from society, that religion, that community, and lose total, shall I say, links with their own antecedents. My name is Nobia Ravetna. I'm from Chicago. I am still a Zoroastrian, and I'll always be a Zoroastrian. Um, I would much rather marry a Zoroastrian to continue the faith, but if, if I don't, I want my children to be accepted, and I want to teach them the Zoroastrian ways. One young man came back from America, inspired. This form is not another piece of paper. This form is asking for you from a sense of what it takes to be a true Zoroastrian, like we all are here. Today we have become apathetic. Today we become people who live in charitable homes, who do a 9 to 5 job and expect everything to work for us. It doesn't. It never did. That's why ancestors came here. Because it was not working in Iran, they came here. The time has come now for us to look at what's not working. The fact of the matter really is that you and me are not working, we're not functioning anymore. It's confronting, it's a hard fact, but it's true. We are the same followers of Zarathustra. We come from the same stock of people who could overnight leave a country and come here and start something remarkable. Who could overnight become the richest minority in this country, the most powerful, and we are that even today. So what is the Zatushan project then? The Zatushan project is an organization which has only one commitment, only one aim, and won't settle for anything less. That is, it wants to end, it is committed to ending all the problems within this faith. Yeah.
Can we get ball pens? Ball pens will be coming to you. Please put your hand up if you don't have a pen. Anybody needs a pen? What we can do and what we will do is work on this. Girls marrying outside. That is true. That couples not marrying because of houses. This is the girls marrying outside. What are you so used to? These are cool things. Yes. What are you used to? What? Girls marrying outside. What are my views? And, uh, Forget about my views. They don't count. Yeah. I'm telling you, when I met you in Pune, I told you for a fact, I have a non-Parsi boyfriend, I want to marry him. Yeah. What am I going to tell them? Yeah. I, why am I getting involved in this when, I, when I'm telling you the fact is if you want me to tell other people that, that, the, that girls are getting married, I said, when I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm not going to give up my boyfriend because I, I'm not going to. Yeah. You are the source of the problem right now exactly. in the current environment. Exactly. I'm no, the how? source of the how, how do you want me to be the solution when I'm the source? So you look at that. If you feel that marrying a non zoroastrian is okay with you, then fine, it's okay with you, it's perfect. If it's not, then it's not the only thing in the world for you. Look at the other solutions. Yeah, so what am I going to do? I'm, and I'm, you're asking me to tell everybody stuff like... Oh, I'm asking you nothing, Matam. I'm asking you whether this is what you want to do. This is not a game you're playing here. I would like to stay in Bombay, work in Bombay, live in Bombay. I've always wanted to. It's nice to have married a Parsi because it's pretty much older than what you were 10 years ago and you could have settled in and adjusted to different ways of life. When you really don't want to spend too much effort adjusting, it's nicer to have somebody who falls in line much easier with your ways. I have a daughter tomorrow if she marries a Parsi. Her children can become Parsis. But what if my sons, they marry Parsi women? That is a, that is a very ticklish and a delicate situation. You must, most people do not remember or have lost sight of the fact that today, the fact that a Parsi man marries a non, I'm sorry, uh, yes, a Parsi man marries a non-Parsi girl, his children are accepted to the fold of the Zoroastrian women. My whole friend circle started to migrate. Some went to Canada, some to America. A couple in London, some have gone down to Australia. Parsis um, don't change, will, they'll die out. But the fact is that Parsis are changing, though the changes are not very drastic, they are changing. I feel very, very strongly still for my community and I feel awfully miserable when I see that it's really, really not going to be there maybe a hundred years from now if things don't change. They have to change. I hope we can overcome our insular attitude, open our doors, allow people to come in, otherwise we can, I don't say we will, but we can certainly with it will. Now, we are very small in number here in India. You just think about our ancestors coming here in a couple of boats 
and today we are 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, whatever it is. They say that we are dwindling down. But you just think about that because there is always ups and downs in a man's life, so in the life of the community. It seems difficult to imagine how it will disappear in a few generations, maybe in many, many generations to come, but it's not got the dynamism it had. I think they'll just die out. <laughs> there is really no future. They're really marrying outside their caste. And there is just a big opening. The world is too wide for them. They're too small a community to try and contain themselves. and it, it's something that has to be continued. sit on it.